The Bible tells us in Romans 5 and 17. It's not my key text. My key text will be Matthew 27. But I need to, I want to get to, I've already started my message, so. And I don't want to keep you long, so please get with me real quick. And then we'll uh, celebrate this day. Amen. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Everybody say, thanks, Adam. Thanks a lot, pal. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Understand, one man got us in, but there's only one man that can get you out. Are right, you hearing what I'm saying? All right. Revelation Jesus speaking in chapter 1, verse 18 says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And he says, I have and have the keys of hell and death. You better get with the one who's got them keys. <laughs> kind of play, he's the key man. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Matthew 27, beginning at verse 50. I, I, there's so much, if you've been, like I said, around a lot of Easter service, you've heard so much. But for some reason, this really stood out to me this week. And I want to speak about this subject. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, there's some symbolism and some things to understand that gives us insight into Old Testament, New Testament. And I, I'm, I don't want to complicate this, and I want to get all theological on you today. I just simply want to preach to you, Jesus. But you need to understand this to understand Jesus. Because when God robed himself in flesh, it wasn't to confuse anybody. He just knew, well, my message will deal with this if you pay attention. Behold, the veil... Of the temple was rent in twain. Everybody say it was torn. torn. From the top to the bottom. Why was it done from the top to the bottom? You have to understand this was a giant curtain. Probably as wide as this building. But a whole lot higher than our ceiling. To let you know. They didn't just go rent a cherry picker. And get some guy. And rip. No. It simply went from the top to the bottom. To let you know. Man didn't do it. Okay. Man didn't do it. Tell somebody. Man didn't do it. And the earth did quake. And the rocks rent. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints. Which slept the rose. Maybe that brother Davenport gives us a little insight. As to what those that have gone on are already doing. They, they're taking a nap. <laughs> I'm not here to talk about that one. But. If you, I love, I love to talk about the Bible, so we can talk about that one some other time. And came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done. Stop and think about that. You had an earthquake. Anybody ever been in an earthquake? Just so y'all know. I lived in California. I was in both the big ones. The Bay, er Bay Area earthquake where the bridge collapsed, I was supposed to be on that bridge at that time that day. But I, I called in sick. Three other men in the church I was in also called in sick the same day. We all worked for the same company who would have been on that bridge. You don't have to believe in God if you don't want to. But I'm going to. I'm going to. And then I was in the one in Northern California. I was up on a, either a 12 or 14 foot ladder wiring a, wiring a custom home. And I kid you not, that ladder started doing this. I just grabbed a hold of them rafters, Brother Terry, and hung on till it stopped. Earthquakes, will, it gets your attention. So all of a sudden they get an earthquake and rocks rent. Now I didn't plan this, but do you realize they break rocks? They drill all these holes in a series in a line and they put these, these metal spikes in them and they hammer these spikes and they hammer. And these guys didn't do it so long that they know they're getting close 
And when they hit that last blow, when that rock splits, it sounds like a crack of thunder. It's just loud. So these guys are in an earthquake. Giant rocks are just shattering. Graves are opening. Look, this, this wasn't Disneyland. <laughs> this was serious stuff. Things in the... Things in the supernatural were going on. It was an amazing moment. But what a lot of people on the outside didn't see that someone on the inside saw were those priests. That, that, that veil was thick. I'm not going to get into all the details about it, but being a rent from... Any, any, anybody ever heard anything really hear that? You imagine that giant curtain. Rip. Rocks shattered, earthquake. Those priests saw that. Wow, what a moment. What a moment. What a moment. And it says they saw the earthquake and those things that were done, and they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Let's place our Bibles down. Let's lift up our hands. Let's talk to Jesus. We love you. You are the same today as you were that day. Lord, I pray for an impartation, an understanding, a spirit of revelation. God, your word declares that you're drawing men unto you. I pray that you draw all of us. Regardless of the struggle, the sin, the past, let today be a day of demarcation. Let it be a resurrection day out of sin for somebody. Let it be a day of healing for somebody. Let, let it be a, just a great momentous moment for somebody. Lord, as the veil is rent, in Jesus' name we pray. Turn to your neighbor and say, the veil was torn and you can be seated. Many things happened at that moment, on the moment when Jesus released and gave up his spirit. The day had become dark at noontime. An earthquake occurred, rocks were split, tombs and graves sprung open, and the saints of old came out. It says that after the resurrection, they were seen in the city. I don't want to fool around with the word of God, but the walking dead. <laughs> but one of the most important events that took place was that the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. You have to understand, this symbolized a few things for us today. It was as if by giant invisible hands at the very moment that Jesus gave up his spirit, grabbed the veil and tore it like a phone book. What did it mean? What does that mean for us today? Well, first in Exodus 26, it says, and thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet. Those are royal colors. And fine twine linen. In some of the places, it says that the veil was easily as thick as a man's hand of cunning work. With cherubim shall it be made, and thou shalt hang it upon the four pillars of the shittim wood, overlaid with gold, and their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. This large piece of material, this veil of blue and purple, crimson and white thread, embroidered with cherubim was many layers and it acted as a barrier or a wall between the holy place and the holy of holies. That's important to understand. And so once a year, the day of atonement, that veil that was for concealment, the, the veil in Greek means that which is spread out before. It symbolized the separation between God and man, and it existed until the blood of Christ eternally atoned for sin. This giant veil, this giant cloth, this 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 thick as a palm of a man's hand, made of 
square sewn together. It historically stated it took 300 priests to lift it. Wow. When God gave the people of Israel the sacrificial system to atone for their sins, he gave them a temple, gave them a priesthood, and prescribed certain animal sacrifices that could temporarily, Hebrews 10.4 says, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. You see, in the Old Testament, sins weren't remitted or taken away. They were merely pushed ahead, kind of like some of y'all do with them bills. Well, well, we'll take care of it next month. I know ain't nobody here doing that, but <laughs> just give them a little bit and take care of it next. Anyway, I'll move on. I don't want, to, I want to get upset at me. It only temporarily covered their sins or rolled them forward. So understand, sins were not forgiven. They were not erased. They were not taken care of. They were only pushed forward. And as you move forward, if you weren't living right, they'd catch up with you. Can I put it that way today? So on that special day, that, that day of atonement, the high priest was to enter the inner sanctuary of the temple, the, the holy of holies. And there's a lot that went into it to prepare him to go to that place behind the veil, the other side of the veil. And he, 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 he went through the, the ceremony and the routine and everything that God required before he could enter into that place. Are oh, you understand what I'm saying? And so, if you want to read that, you can read that in Leviticus 16. But during his visit in the Holy of Holies, there was the imminent danger mm -hmm, of death due to a failure in some aspect of the high priest's atonement or personal sin. Any mistake, if he entered into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, he would die. Now, I've been around this a long time, and if historical sources say that when he went in, there was a rope that was tied around his leg. That way, if the dude messed up, <laughs> playing the part but wasn't the part they could they could drag him out how many how many is glad it ain't that way right now you know here here he is he's got the golden candlestick the the table of showbread the the the, the altar of incense the brazen all, all those things and if you want to know more about that i got an amazing bible study we can sit down and i show you it's a beautiful picture of salvation the plan of salvation today the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin we know that because the veil that symbol of separation between God and man, it was never taken away in the Old Testament. You know how many sacrifices, you know how many great sacrifices, no matter whatever they, or how many things they did, that veil remained between God and us. The animal's blood wasn't enough. And so when you look at the day Jesus went to the cross. He died approximately around in the afternoon about 3 p.m. Just before the Passover sacrifices. While Jesus is going up Calvary's hill, there's all these priests doing all these atonements in the temple. At the same time. There were probably hundreds, if not thousands, of priests on duty that day. It is said that the population of Jerusalem would swell to more than two million as people made their pilgrimages to the temple for the annual celebration. 
And notice it's it's gotten a little smaller over the years as people don't quite look at Easter anymore. It's sad that a bunny's had such a influence on so many minded people. The temple was probably jammed, packed with multitudes of people with their lambs and their sacrifices. The high priests and his associates were preparing the evening sacrifice within the holy place. They tended the many lights of the golden candlestick. Some priests were busy in the holy place on this side of the veil which hung between them and the holy of holies, kind of like the picture you have on the overhead. But at the very instant that Jesus gave up his spirit, that massive fortified veil that stood before the Holy of Holies was suddenly rent or torn in half from top all the way to the bottom. Remember, that veil was thick. It took 300 priests to lift it. At exact moment that Jesus was taking his last breath on the cross, Caiaphas, the high priest, was standing at his station in the inner court of the temple, preparing to offer the blood of a spotless in Passover. That sound of that day, the sight before it, not only deafening, but frightening ripping from the top and going all the way down to the floor. The microphone fell. I didn't know. I apologize. Only God could have torn that veil. Imagine the priests not only seeing but hearing that giant piece of fabric tearing at the same moment an earthquake is taking place, shaking the temple, shaking the city. Fear struck every priest. Horror as all this happened because all of a sudden that veil being torn would release <laughs> the awesome presence and the power of God. And so fearing sudden death, they probably ran. <laughs> this miracle meant that the whole system of types and shadows and ceremonies that we were given with the Mosaic law had come to an end. What began with Moses when he went up to Mount Sinai, ended when Jesus went up Mount Carmel. When he went up Calvary, something happened. Well, more than just a, a man brutalized and carrying a cross, something spiritual took place. You see, the veil never ripped. Was not ripped when they beat Jesus. Did not rip then. The veil did not rip when all the disciples scattered and deserted him. The veil didn't even rip while he carried the cross up that hill. The veil did not rip while they were hammering nails in his hands and feet. The veil did not even rip as he hung on the cross and was crucified. That veil only tore when he died and gave up the ghost. Everybody say ghost. That's because a will or testament is in force only when somebody has died. Anybody got a last will and testament where you're giving things to people? Anybody? You may be on that, but you can't get a thing until I'm. 
Jesus has something for you, but you couldn't get it until he died. Hebrews tells us 9, 16, and 17, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Get it? For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. That's in your Bible. That's giving you an understanding of what Christ did. This isn't just in there so you know how to legally handle your business when it comes to your death. It's letting us know what's going on in the spirit realm and how you and I gain access to the things of God for our sin. Church isn't something that's just thought up by man. It's God's plan. The church as a building is really no different than Noah's heart. He had, they had to be in that to be saved. You got to be in the church to be saved. The moment, the instant Jesus drew his last breath and died, the new covenant promised in Jeremiah 31 and 31 was put into effect. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. Which my covenant they broke. In other words, it only rolled ahead. It didn't work. They, they just, they never got it. Although I was a husband unto them. You see this whole husband and bride thing. It was going on then, but it's just a little deeper now. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Say it the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts <laughs> and write it on their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Paul kind of lays it out for you in Colossians 1, 21 through 27. Listen to me clearly. Follow along in your Bible, please. Colossians 1, 21 and 20 through 27. And you that were sometime alienated. It's okay if you're alienated today. And enemies in your mind by wicked works. Ain't no one perfect and clean in here. We all got something to take care of at an altar today. I don't care how good you think you are. Notice it said enemies in your mind. You better understand something here with work. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy. Remember the priest had to clean up to get in there? Well, Jesus wants to clean you up so, so he can get in here. Holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. My God. You want to talk about, he don't only want to just have you take the test, but he wants to take the test for you. Y'all ain't hearing me. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, you got to stay in. You can't get in and out of the ark back then in Noah's time any more than you can get in and out of church. You got to get in and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoiceth in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. This is his body. Remember, the, are you hearing what I'm saying? Whereof I am made minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me, for you, to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Anybody, anybody here see it? Anybody here recognize it? Anybody here got the revelation? Oh, thank God, I'm a, I want to be a saint of God. To whom God would make known what is the riches of, his, of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you. You see, they needed to get in the Holy of Holies. But today God wants to get the Holy of Holies in you. The hope of glory. You see, the Old Testament was trying to get man into God. But the New Testament is trying to get God in you. Well, let me say that again. The Old Testament was trying to get them into God. 
But today God's trying to get in you. Oh, you see, when you receive the Holy Ghost, that's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the promise. That's the plan. You see, you see, he couldn't, they, they couldn't live for God following him. So God said, if I get in you, I'm going to help you live for me. Uh, that's why the veil was rent. That's the whole purpose of why it was torn, to release it. Now, to whosoever will, the Spirit of God is open and available to anybody. That's the, what the resurrection is for. That's what Easter is all about. We're all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. But when that veil is rent, there's a way of escape made. There's a way to get out of this mess. There's a way to get your sin taken care of. There's a way to get your problem sick. There's a way to go, oh, thank you, Jesus. It's available to anybody that wants to be born again. Everybody say, that's available to me. That's why it was so important when Jesus was approached by Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and telling him, marvel not that I say ye must be born again. He tells this man twice, how are you born again? How do you receive God's spirit in you? How do you know you receive the Holy Ghost? Acts chapter 2. Then Peter said unto them, repent. That's really, you know, that's really, the only thing that makes repentance difficult is human pride. Look, you and your wife can get along all the time if you just swallow your pride and be nice to each other. Repent. If, if I've been acting like a jerk, I don't need to take a week to apologize. And that's my pride. What? Oh, it's, it's Easter, but let's quit acting like it's... Uh, uh, we got, I got issues. I know y'all ain't got none, so we'll just use me today. Y'all just get along all the time. Y'all like the same food. It was stale, cold. She put that in front of y'all. It's wonderful, baby doll. You lion dog. <laughs> what you keep in the peace? I'll give you that one. Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Why? He's the one that paid the price. He's the one that paid it. That's the name above every name. Neither is there salvation in any other. Look, when I write a check to you, I can't put Mickey Mouse, I can't put Father, I can't put Son, and I can't put Holy Ghost on there. I better put my name on there, Steve Crow. You want, you, hey, you want the power uh, of the authority. You better get the name applied to your life. Paul, uh, P Peter's not stumbling here. He's not fumbling here. Every disciple standing there listening to him preach this message. For the remission of sins. Isn't that what I need? It's a good thing when cancer goes in remission. It's a better thing when sins go in remission. Cancer will only kill the body, but sins will kill your soul. Sin will drag your soul to hell. You see, and, and for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's, that's Christ in you. That's the whole point. It's out of the Holy of Holies and in you, and you're the temple of God. Oh, Lord, have it. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for this promise. Look, if you give a promise yesterday, is this still valid today? You're sitting there all quiet because you're sitting next to someone and saying, man, you lying dog. Uh, you, you promised you was going to take me to Fleming's Friday night. Man, that McDonald's didn't cut it. <laughs> we was going to go up to the Olive Garden. You took me down there to Wendy. I got all dressed up and made you a wonderful meal. And you was late. I thank God that God is not slack concerning his promises. As some men count slackness. That's in the Bible. For this promise is unto you. Point to your neighbor and say, he's talking to you. And to your children. Point to someone else and say, he's talking to you too. And to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You see, the Holy Ghost is Christ in you. That's the whole point of the resurrection and the veil being torn was so that you and I could receive the spirit of God in us. 
Acts 19, there's a situation. These are wonderful people. And it says, verses 1 through 6, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. That's another town full of people. And finding certain disciples. These were believers. You can be a believer and not get it all right. That's okay. Don't, don't let your pride get in the way. And he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Why? Jesus didn't go to the cross for grins and giggles. He went there so that we could change dispensations, yeah. so that we could change because the, the, the testament, the testator was going to die to release the promise. He's asking, did you get your promise yet? Did you get the power yet? You're a believer, but do you have the power to overcome that sin? How many get sick and tired of doing the same things over and over again? And, 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 you know, now, now, ladies, I'm going to tell you something. Quit getting on to your husband if he tells you he's going to get into a project. He'll get it. Man, don't come to him three months later and ask him about it. He's going to get it done. It took something. Yeah, boy, it took you a minute. <laughs> Listen. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They said, we have not heard anything whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, under them, what were you baptized? It matters. The world is going to tell you it doesn't matter, but that's the same world that tells you there's an Easter bunny and a Santa Claus. The same world's going to tell you you, you you can choose what your gender is. Biology ain't got nothing to do. All that is to point to say God is not real, doesn't exist, or doesn't know what he's doing. We know better. Look, look, I don't even have to point to none of y'all to realize how jacked up people are. I've been living with me for 54 years. We're jacked up. We're messed up. Man, I'm driving down the road. I'm full. I know what I'm doing. I'm trucking down the road, the frontage road out there. You know, you call them service roads here. Coming to 27th along the frontage. And this jacked up person in his car is in the middle lane and decides to stop and think whether he wants to turn right from the middle lane, and I'm coming behind him, and I've had a green light the whole time. I didn't slow down. I'm like you. I was like, she's normal. They're normal. She's normal. Whatever. They know green means go. They didn't. So I'm doing willy-nilly through the intersection trying to avoid the jack wagon that didn't realize green meant go, not stop in the middle of the intersection. Hey, we do some dumb stuff. Anybody ever done something dumb? I, I, let me tell you something, and that's just a trivial thing. It's a sad day when we'll, we'll tell kids, listen, hey, and I, parents, be parents, and don't you allow the government or these schools to tell you how to raise your kids. Get in that Bible and get that Bible in your children before you wake up and that wonderful little boy think you named him Nick, now becomes Nick. Stop, don't allow them to do that. God is not the author of confusion. Take lead in, in, in raising them kids. God gave you. Don't, are you hearing what I'm saying? They're going to get mad at me. I don't even care. But get, get real here about this thing. There's a reason all this is being said and all this is being done. God has a plan. Because he gave us a promise. He's not slack. If you're here today, the promise is for you. Easter ain't just a day just to celebrate me, even though we'll do those things. Easter isn't just a day for kids, even though we're going to make sure they enjoy themselves. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But we're not going to forget what it's really about. And when that veil was torn, God's spirit was released. And Paul is talking to these folks, saying, have you received that spirit? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? I'm telling you, when you get that, when you get that, like Joel said, this is that. That was spoken of by the prophet. Oh, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. I don't know about. Give me. I want the spirit of God in me. Then said Paul, John, very like, oh, see, under them what were you baptized? I mean, I heard you. And they said under John's baptism, you just can't live your life saying sorry to God all the time. You got to get beyond repentance. You got to quit doing the same thing over and over and coming. Look, y'all think I'm crazy, but maybe I spent too much time alone. And while I was kind of rehearsing this thought, I held a conversation 
with myself like I was praying. And so I repeated things over and over to God because I wanted to know what it audibly sounded like when God hears us pray. You ready? Can you imagine if you were God? And I need Verdell, 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 oh, Verdell, 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 Verdell. I walk up, slap the fire out of me, and say, What? Sitting around saying, Jesus, 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 and needing to repent all the time. Look, you're going you're gonna to take that kid to the doctor. What's the matter with my baby? What's the, ma what's the matter with my child? All it does is come up to me and say, Mommy, 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 Mommy. Look, I'm not, look, I ain't making fun of nobody. You have to understand. We've been influenced by a messed up world. Now, if you ain't ready to call it a messed up world, then, you know, I, 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 may, not, I may not be able to help you today, but God can. Because whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is you face, what, and I'll get to that in a minute. He's ready to help you. But you can't live, listen to me, you can't live at the perpetual place of saying sorry with God. You've got to have enough faith to believe in him that he is faithful and just to forgive. So he asked them, until what were you baptized? John's baptism. He said, you know, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And so when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They, they did it. They, they, they followed. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost, that promise, the torn veil came upon them, and they spake with tongues. They got the Holy Ghost. In other words, the Old Testament was trying to get them in God. All of a sudden, they got God in them. Remember, in order to survive the flood, you had to be in the ark. You, you don't just walk into this church. You're born into it. You're born again like Jesus told Nicodemus. That's why when you come to church and you decide you want to give your life to God, you repent. We baptize you. We bury you. The death. Remember? The death. And today is what? What day? When you come out of that water, that's your representative of resurrection. And you receive the Holy Ghost. That's why the veil. And I tell you, the only way to escape death and hell is through being born again into the church, the body of Christ, which is his bride. Remember he told in the Old Testament, I tried to be a husband to them. You see, he wants us to become his bride. Who opened up and preached the very first New Testament church message? Peter, I read it to you. Acts 2.38 is the culmination of Peter's message. Peter has the keys to the church. Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You want to be able to withstand hell? You want to be able to withstand all that? That's what the resurrection's for. You get into the church. That's how he's going to build his church. When Peter got up and preached, he was holding the keys. He was holding those keys. He said, this is how you make it. You repent. You get baptized in Jesus' name. You get filled with the Holy Ghost, and it will lead and guide you into all truth. It'll help you with habits. It'll help you with addiction. It'll help walk you right out of those problems. If you're lying, if you're cheating, if you're sick, the Holy Ghost will help heal you. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. It was the blood of God, but God's a spirit, so how did God get blood? He robed himself in a body. Mary donated the flesh, but God gave his spirit. 
And the Bible says in Acts 20, 26 through 28, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. You know I'm doing that today. I'm giving it to you. No one will be without excuse who's within the sound of my voice who listens to this today. Take heed, therefore, unto yourself. Mm -hmm. And to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The sacrifice, this whole thing was not an afterthought with God. 1 Peter 1 and 20 says he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. The book of Revelation tells us that Jesus is the lamb slain from the creation of the world in Revelation 13.8. Paul said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and all things become new. Easter or rather the resurrection, means now you and I have free access to the presence of God. It's not behind a veil. It's not blocked. There's not a wall of partition that stops you. Your sin can't stop you because he came for that. We can now walk again as Adam and Eve once did with the voice of the Lord in the cool of the day. Everything we lost in Adam, we now regain in Christ. That rending or the tearing of that veil means that the way into the holiest was laid open to us today. To fully understand the crucifixion and the resurrection. I, I, I want to close with this story. I thought of Brother Laulu while I was navigating this. Many years ago, in the Polynesian islands, there were numerous tribes. The largest tribe had a great chieftain who was strong, powerful, and unmatched. But sadly, stealing started to happen in this tribe, which was unheard of. It was really considered a huge crime, and stealing was very rare since they all lived for the betterment of the tribe. So when the stealing started, everyone was in shock because the punishment for stealing was so severe. The punishment of being whipped was almost sure to take your life. And sadly, this, this tribe is suffering from stealing and the thief was unknown. When they first tried to find the thief, the punishment was 20 lashes. But sadly, the, the stealing continued, and so the chief decided to raise it to 40 lashes. When the thief persevered, continued to steal, and got away with it, in anger and upsetness for the division being caused in the tribe, he raised it again to 50 lashes. This was significant because no one could survive 50 lashes except maybe the most strongest of men. And finally, a shriek was heard. Crowd gathered. The thief was caught. They had the thief. And they dragged the thief to the city center before the chief and the town elders. And to everyone's shock, the town people were aghast. The elders and the, and the chief were breathless and in disbelief. It was there before everyone. The conniving thief was the chief's own mother. Everyone looked, stared at the chief. What would he do? Could he punish his own mother? 
Could he really order his own mother to be whipped 50 times? The silence became deafening. Would, would he punish her? Surely not his own mother. But would he keep his word? Would he change the punishment now that it hit close to home? And so would he render his own laws and word useless? Would the immoral actions of his mother destroy his honor because he was forced to go back on his word? An eerie silence swept over the scene. Only the muffled, broken sounds of the chief's whimpering mother could be heard, along with a few scattered, hushed whispers from the townspeople who had all now gathered to see what would happen. She stood there in full embarrassment and shame for all to see and witness the person that had caused so much pain to so many. All eyes were on the chief. By decree, the thief had to be brought before him and whipped. But what would he do? Suddenly the silence was broken. And with a booming voice of authority, he commanded, tie her up. Bring the whips. He turned to the punishment administrators. Prepare to strike. And as those burly soldiers got up and in place and readied their whips, the chief, with a booming but broken voice, cried, Stop! And he stepped down from off his throne. Removed his kingly robe and came over and placed his large body over that of his frail mother's and stood between her and the punishment administrators. And again, with a strong, determined voice ordered, proceed with punishment. And they whipped him 50 times. You see, as we all stand, that is the picture of what Jesus did for us on Calvary. You see, he went to Calvary to receive the punishment for what we've done. He didn't detail it because we've all done something different. We're all guilty and we've all come short of the glory of God. But he stepped off that throne, robed himself in flesh and came and stood between us and the punishment that we deserved. But he didn't just come to take the punishment. He came to set us free. You see, Jesus, the greatest man in history, had no slaves. But they called him master. He had no degrees. But they called him teacher. He had no medicines, but they called him healer. He had no army, but kings feared him. He won no battles, but he conquered the world. He committed no sin. And no crimes. Yet they crucified him. And 
they buried him in a tomb. Yet he lives today. He lives today. In this temple. In this temple.